we've had a few questions come in through the week that have been sent in, so we've, yeah, we've got another opportunity to answer a few questions. Uh, Nathan's away for his weekend, so he's not joining us, but me and Ian are going to tackle the questions, so I'll ask the first one. Let's get into it. Okay, so the first one is, is there a difference, and if so, what is the difference between Christians working in secular work or in ministry? And in answering that question, referencing uh, Colossians 3.23, work for the Lord, and 1 Corinthians 15.58, work of the Lord. So is there a difference between secular work and ministry? And what's that difference is the question. Yeah, I'm happy to kick us off. Um, I would say yes and no. I'm going to try and explain what I mean by that and what I don't mean by that. Uh, fundamentally, no. I think that work that God has called us to do is fundamental to every Christian. And the issue is not am I working for the Lord or am I not working for the Lord, but rather I am working for the Lord. And the only difference is some of us get paid for it and some of us don't get paid for it to do it in a full-time capacity. So I would want to argue that every Christian uh, is working for God, and the way in which you work for God is highly important. And so I would want to say, God sometimes says to some of us, like myself and Will, I'm going to set you aside where I will allow you or give you opportunity to be paid to work full-time for me and to be set aside so that you can dedicate your time to work for me in that capacity. But then again, I don't see that as a fundamental difference between, say, someone who is a plumber and God says, I've gifted you in that area of your life and I'm going to call you to work uh, as a plumber in a full-time capacity as a, plum a plumber and want you to then dedicate your work to me so that you're working as if you were in a full-time paid capacity, if that makes sense. So that work, whether it's here in a church context for me, or whether it's an accountant or a doctor, lawyer, plumber, a carpenter, doesn't matter. We are all working for the Lord. And so we dedicate ourselves to working in that capacity, be, ca capacity and being a witness for God in that capacity as we work uh, for the Lord. Yes, in the sense that I get paid to do what some of you can only do on a voluntary basis. I think, quite honestly, from James, that my accountability before God is going to be greater than your accountability before God, because God says that those who are given over to the teaching and the preaching of God's Word stand in, in, in terms of judgment one day as to how we've served God with a higher accountability, uh, because we have the ability in our teaching to exercise, whether we like it or not, influence on those to whom we are teaching. And so that means when I stand before God and give an account one day, I stand under greater scrutiny than those of you who are not called to be teachers. And particularly for me who have been called as a, in a, in a paid full-time capacity to do, that, to do that. And so that there's a sense of great sobering for me, recognizing that uh, the weight of responsibility on my shoulders is going to be tremendous, which is why, again, I try and take great care in the teaching, and which is why when some of you may say, why are you preaching for at least 40 minutes? Because of that weight of responsibility, and I bear that, and I want to make sure that am I, as I'm communicating, I've done that clearly, I've done that in a way that's understandable, and I've done that in a way that is faithful to the text. But in terms of working we're all called to work it's just in different capacities that we call to work and so we do it to the best of our ability to the best of our gifts to the glory of god whether that is being paid for it as i am or whether it's you out there in a secular uh, job where you're working also for the lord i hope that makes a little bit of sense uh, maybe you mm. want to add to that will yeah i mean i would just add in the sense of like that Colossians verse really shows that we work as though we're working for the Lord in all things. And then as well, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of Christ. So it's not that one thing brings about more glory to God. They both bring about glory to God. And, and they're not different in that sense. I guess the difference is, like you said, one can focus their time in a way and be more focused in that way. And then the other difference is accountability as well that will be held to account. And I guess the only other thing that I've thought of and 
I've got my Bible open here, was in Ephesians 4.11. I guess the role's slightly different. It talks about the different gifts, um, though some are called to be teachers, uh, evangelists, and then it says the purpose of those gifts and what they're to do. It's, it says in verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So teachers, pastors, they're to prepare everyone else for ministry. So it's, it's no, no different. They're, they're doing ministry and they're just preparing others for ministry as well and everyone else is involved in ministry. Uh, so yeah, it is a yes and no type of answer, I think, but it's good. Okay, well, the uh, next question is about uh, someone on their deathbed. If, if we had to read one passage of Scripture to someone on their deathbed, what would that passage be? I think you've probably had a bit more experience with this, but I, I could kick it off and say I'd, I'd probably run to some of the Psalms. I mean, I just, I think what someone needs on their deathbed is hope and encouragement, which we all need, and I often find myself going to the Psalms for hope and encouragement. Psalm 23 would probably a, be a great one uh, for someone on their deathbed. I've found the few times I have been able to do it, that's normally what people have asked for, is a Psalm. And then, I mean, the other great one would be, which you mentioned this morning, 1 Corinthians 15 at the end, there's no, no sting in death, there's no victory anymore because of what Christ has done. I think that's a great passage to remember because it points us to that future hope and that's what they need. But you would have um, more insight. Yes, <laughs> that's a, a really interesting question. I, I, I can honestly say that I've had to do this many times where I've read to people who sometimes are in a coma, others who are in the very, very last stages of life. I remember uh, reading scripture to a man who the next day died and he knew that and we all knew that um, and uh, so what, I, what I've tended to do is I, I don't necessarily read one passage of scripture I would generally read a few passages of scripture along the same lines on the occasion that I, I've only been able to do one I will try and assess the situation so I will look at the person who's dying if there is a a doubt about salvation security, I'll go to a passage like John 10, John and John 6 and John 10, 30, and try and read something that will help them to realize their salvation is secure. Or perhaps I might go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Um, if it is someone who has run the race well and now is looking forward to what is lying ahead and so their confidence in their salvation I might go to Revelation 21 and read verses 1 through to 4 or I might go to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18 if it's someone who needs reassurance in their eternal life and uh, reassurance that uh, as they close their eyes in death they will be in heaven I might go to John 11 and read some parts of John 11 or I might go to 1 Corinthians 15 and read verses 15 to 57, or I might uh, turn my attention to John 14, verses 1 to 6, and then read those that uh, remind us of where we're going. If the person needs some strength in these last days and they're feeling as though they just need some hope in, in, in the strength as they see out their last days, I might go to Psalm 23, I might go to Psalm 46, uh, I might go to Psalm 121. I might go to Job sometimes because there's Job 121 uh, and then uh, the other passage in Job where he looks ahead and says, uh, even though my skin shall be destroyed, yet in my skin, in my flesh, I shall see God. And, and so it varies a little bit for me, uh, depending on the situation uh, that I'm facing with as I read on a deathbed. But I will... In, in most cases, and Janice may have been with me at times, but where someone is on their deathbed, I will read a composition of different passages rather than just going to one particular passage. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but it, it would be on the passages that really talk about where the person is heading, where they're going, the comfort in knowing that their salvation is secure, that Jesus has got them in the palm of his hand. He's not going to let them go. And then occasionally, I might even go to Romans 8, where I'll read verses 35 through to 39 that speak in, in wonderful terms about the love of God and just remind them that, yes, they're going to be separated from loved ones right now, but they'll never be separated from the love of God if they have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a little bit varied for me in terms of 
what I may or may not read, and I, I've had to do this. I, I can't even begin to count how many times I've done this, but that's generally. I have realized over time, I'm very careful when I go to John 11, because John 11 deals with Lazarus's death. And when you talk about Jesus's delay, because Jesus delayed for at least about, well, around about 10 days altogether, if you count the four days of the journey and how long it took the message to get to him and then back to Lazarus. Um, I read it once and there was a lady who was dying and she groaned when I got to the fact that Jesus delayed. So I thought, well, that wasn't actually probably the best passage I could have read in those circumstances. So I will pick and choose from John 11 and I will generally go to where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Mm. And I will focus on that verse. So I hope that's a little bit helpful to you. Um, but it has been challenging to do that over the years. Mm. Very comprehensive answer. That's good. I, and I guess it all comes down to you you're giving, like you said, the, I guess the promises of God that they need. And that's important, the situation they're in. Giving them the promises of God that they need in that, in that moment. Well, a final question we have here is... It's sort of two questions, really. Why are there so many differences between Christians? Why are there so many denominations when God wants unity in the church? What should we do to be united with other Christians? So, I can start us off, yeah. I think, I guess, it, I would say it comes down to one word in terms of why there are so many differences and there's so many de denominations. It's because of sin in the end. It's either pride, not willing to work together. Uh, it's either our failures in understanding things, we, we all fail in some way in having everything right in God's Word. We, none of us have it perfect, so that's going to be uh, something that will bring it about. There's also, I guess, our sin that can bring hurt in how we deal with one another, that can create these differences, um, and then denominations can form because of that. So I think it comes down to our sin, and then, so then I would say in response to how can we grow to be united as Christians, we really need to battle sin. We need to battle pride as well, I think, we need to learn to humbly accept God's Word and what it says. That's often a big reason why we do have splits, because sometimes we aren't willing to accept what God's saying. So I think we need to battle sin, uh, battle our pride, and in that way then we'll be more united and be able to seek to be united as sin's defeated. I think at a fundamental level, that's right. I mean, it is our sinfulness that has caused this. At a historical level, uh, when you look at the church, really denomination, denominations began to spring up as a result of, I think, some of the way in which the Catholic Church began to move. And so uh, where you have uh, uh, the Reformation beginning in round about the 1500s um, and the seeds of that being sown in the 1400s, but the Catholic Church at that stage was really the dominant church that was in existence. And then from that, as the Reformation began, you had a whole lot of different churches beginning to spring up, whether it's Lutheran, whether it's Reformed churches. And then further down the line, you had charismatic churches coming out more in the 19th century and so on. So historically, you can look at, at, at some of the movements and, and why they occurred. Um, I think there are differences in as time has developed in our understanding of how theology works its way out. So different emphases have been held by different denominations. So if you were to trace, for example, the Baptist movement, you'll see it, it, it's a separatist movement fundamentally where people separated out and decided they didn't want to be ruled by the governing authorities, by the Church of England, uh, if you were to really trace its roots, roots back. Um, and then when you get to, you know, the, the 1900s and the late 1900s, you, you have the charismatic movement, particularly around about the 1920s, beginning to move out because they had a different focus on the charismatic gifts, if you like. And then you had denominations uh, going from there. I, I think that I look at it and say, well, yes, Will was correct. It, it's, it's because of our sinfulness and our, our want to to have our own particular bents. Uh, but at another level, I kind of look at it in a positive way because there are some people who will come to Christ in the Presbyterian Church who are not going to come to Christ in the Baptist Church. And there are some who are going to come to Christ in the Anglican Church who are not going to come to Christ in the Presbyterian Church. And so while there, there's a sense of lack of unity amongst Christians because we have different emphases 
Anglicans baptize babies, we don't as Baptists, and, and so there are different emphases in, in terms of our theology. Those denominations that have stayed true to the gospel at a fundamental level, who have understood the, the message of the gospel, the death, the resurrection, the historical reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. I look at the, those denominations now, if you don't focus on the differences at a less fundamental level, and I think, well, it's catering for a range of different people. Now, some people by nature are more uh, exuberant and perhaps prefer a different style of worship that is more suited to the, the charismatic flavor, and some get drawn into those kinds of churches. But if the gospel is faithfully being presented there, preached week after week, then at least we know that they are saved and we have a, a church that will perhaps better suit their particular style of personality, character, temperament, whatever you want to call it. If I like, yes, I know from a world's perspective, they look at us and they just see fragmentation and they see all these different denominations and, and see it as a competition. I tend to try and take the competition uh, part out of it. So I think to myself, if we've got good churches in the Hills District and that are particularly suited to different kinds of people and they find a home there and the gospel is faithfully preached, well, I'm going to rejoice because I know that they're getting fed by the word of God, that they have a place where they can exercise their gifts, that maybe if they came to this church, they would feel constrained or in some way limited by coming to this church. And so uh, good for them, as long as the gospel is faithfully being preached in those churches. Will we ever be able to unify as a total church? Absolutely at the second coming of Christ. Then the church will be brought together, all its different dimensions, whether Anglican, Presbyterian, Baptist, uh, whatever you like, where all true Christians are, and then the church will be one. Will we get there before the second coming of Christ? I don't think so. Because I think some of our emphases on how we understand how church is going to operate are going to remain in place. We do church government by congregation. Uh, other churches do it through a hierarchical system. Are we going to now suddenly change our congregational system to fit into a hierarchical system? I don't think so. Are they going to change their hierarchical system into a, a congregational system? No. So we live with the tension of having different denominations now. I don't think we should see that as a threat to the unity of the church because the unity of the church is not based on denominationalism is based on our fundamental understanding of what the gospel is and who Jesus is. And on that, I can say, we would agree with many different denominations. We would say, yes, your understanding of the gospel is the same as our understanding of the gospel. When it comes to what we emphasize in terms of the non-fundamentals, we're a little bit different. And so we, we don't see that as a threat to our unity. I think on, on our fundamentals, we are unified on our doctrinal emphases on non-fundamentals, we are a little different. So I don't see it necessarily as a disunified situation amongst Christians, but rather more like a kaleidoscope where you've got a whole lot of different uh, expressions of the gospel uh, that comes forward in denominations. I hope that kind of makes a little bit of sense. Mm. Uh, so I, 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 in a sense, almost celebrate that because I, I think it's allowing for more people to come into the kingdom of God that are reached through different denominations that hold true to the gospel. And I think it's important, like noting that that's the second de secondary differences, you know, there, whereas there are some different denominations and differences between us with other churches that trace back to core doctrine and where it is heretical and the, the Reformation was needed in those ways to to separate out and bring about the truth and be focused on the truth. So there will be, at times, differences, even uh, necessary ones, but, yeah, there is that as well. That oftentimes, secondary issues that are between us that aren't as important and don't need to separate us as much as they do. And, and just to add to that very quickly, Paul talks about things of first importance. So even in Paul's language, he talks mm -hmm. about a distinction between what is fundamental, first importance, and then what is secondary. And so I think, you know, we need to just keep that and maintain that um, on fundamentals agreement. On non-fundamentals, we show charity and we show understanding and we accept that others may do things a little differently to us. Mm. And we celebrate that. Mm. Excellent. Well, we'll do this again in a few weeks, I guess. So prepare some questions and 
Get ready to send them in. Joshua 18, 1 to 10. Is that correct? I'm oh, sorry. I won't. Sorry. Our order of service must have changed. <laughs> um, anyway, let's pray together. Our Father, we bow before you this evening in humble adoration. We come before you as our great God. And we humble ourselves because you have said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up. And we want to recognize who we are in relation to who you are. And we are dust that has had life breathed into it. You are the creator of the universe. You are the sustainer of the universe. You are the one who is sovereignly in control of all things. Every breath we take is dependent upon your grace. And so we want to acknowledge who you are and in relation to who we are. And we want to say to you, thank you for the life that you have given us. We are so grateful that you brought us into existence. We are so grateful that you have enabled us to enjoy a relationship with you. We want to thank you for sending your son into this world. We want to thank you for the forgiveness that he brings and the way that he reconciles us to you. We want to thank you for the life that he gives us, for we recognize that true life is bound up in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you that we can talk to you and we can pray to you and you hear us and you respond to our prayers. We thank you for every answered prayer that you bring to us and we know that you always answer our prayers and we want to give thanks to you that we can bring to you our burdens for you have said cast your burdens on me for I care for you and we know that you do care for us and we want to thank you that we can lay our anxieties at your door for you have said do not be anxious about anything but in everything with thanksgiving in your heart bring your prayers and petitions to me and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and guard your minds and we know that is true. So we thank you that in the midst of the turbulence that sometimes we face in life we can bring those things to you, we can lay them at your feet and we know that you are able to give to us a peace that is beyond our ability to describe in this world. We want to thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us the gifts that come from you. We want to thank you for the security of our salvation bound up with the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you that you love us eternally. And we know that your love has been demonstrated to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you that it is a love that will see us through to the end. We thank you that you have revealed in your word that nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you that in Christ you have made us more than conquerors. We thank you that we celebrate and share in the victory of Christ, that he who has conquered sin, he who has broken the power of sin, breaks the power of sin in our own lives and has conquered sin on our behalf. And we thank you that we can celebrate and share in that victory that you have won over sin. We thank you for the hope that you have placed within our hearts, a firm and sure hope, unlike the hopes in this world, a hope that we know will be finally realized when the Lord Jesus Christ comes or when we depart from this world through the doors of death and enter into eternity where we will live with you forever. 
We want to thank you for the reality of the kingdom that you are preparing in advance for us. You have gone ahead of us and prepared many rooms so that one day we will be with you and we will enjoy that eternal life in your presence. We thank you that we can look forward to the Lamb's Supper one day where we will be gathered, a multitude that no man can number, gathered to eat at the Feast of the Lamb where we will to be, get, be together unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the way in which you care for us and watch over us. We thank you for your provisions. When we think about what we lack, we lack for nothing because of the Lord Jesus Christ's wonderful promise to us that he shall give to us and meet all our needs according to the glorious riches that are in Jesus Christ. We thank you that when we are tempted, you provide a way for us to bear up under that temptation. We thank you that we can have joy in trials, for you give to us a joy that passes uh, all sense of understanding in this world, a joy that permeates the depths of our soul. And we thank you that we know that when we do face trials in this life, that when we pray to you and you bring those trials to you, you have promised to give us wisdom to know how to deal with those trials, to know how to handle those trials. And we thank you that when our strength comes to the end, that your grace is sufficient for us, for your power is made perfect in weakness. And you have reminded us in your word that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we thank you that when all seems to be against us, we know that you are for us because you have said in your word, if God be for us, who can be against us? So we thank you for all these blessings that you pour out on us. And we thank you for every spiritual blessing that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been blessed in the heavenly rounds with every spiritual blessing. We thank you that you withhold nothing from your children, but that you bless us abundantly, both with life and with godliness. And we thank you, Lord Jesus that we have the privilege of being able to serve you. We thank you that you strengthen us to serve you. And we thank you for this great joy that we can exercise when we do serve you. We pray this evening that you would help us as your people to be faithful in the proclamation of the gospel. Oh God, give us a heart for the lost. Help us to see the terrible predicament that they are in. Burden us with their souls. And we pray that you would help us to take hold of every opportunity to share your gospel with those who don't know you. We thank you for our time that we can share and celebrate together in worship. And as we worship you this evening, whether it be through hearing those songs being sung to us, whether it be through prayer, whether it be through the reading of your word, whether it be through the Q&A, whether it be through the preaching of your word, we pray that in all things the Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted and you would be glorified for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're continuing in the book of Joshua tonight, so please take your Bibles and turn to chapter 18. So verses 1 to 10, and we'll skip over a fair bit and just do the last three verses in chapter 19. So chapter 18, commencing at verse 1. The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The country was brought under their control, but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers has given you? Appoint three men from each tribe. I will send them out to make a survey of the land and to write a description of it, according to the inheritance of each. Then they will return to me. You are to divide the land into seven parts. Judah is to remain in its territory on the south, and the house of Joseph in its territory on the north. After you have written descriptions of the seven parts of the land, bring them here to me, and I will cast lots for you in the presence of the Lord our God. 
The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you because the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have already received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it to them. As the men started on their way to map out the land, Joshua instructed them, go and make a survey of the land and write a description of it. Then return to me and I will cast lots for you here at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. So the men left and went through the land. They wrote its description on a scroll, town by town, in seven parts, and returned to Joshua in the camp at Shiloh. Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord, and there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. And over in chapter 19 and verse 49. When they had finished dividing the land into its allotted portions, the Israelites gave Joshua, son of Nun, an inheritance among them, as the Lord had commanded. They gave him the town he asked for, Timnath Serah, in the hill country of Ephraim, and he built up the town and settled there. These are the territories that Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel assigned by Lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And so they finished dividing the land. This is God's word. Well, this evening we're continuing through our series in Joshua. We've got Joshua chapter 18 and 19. We're going to get through this evening. And before we get into it, let's pray uh, before we see some of these things. Let's pray. God, we really pray for your help now as we come to your word. We are in need of you. We are in need of your spirit to work amongst us, a work amongst us to convict us to open our eyes, to see the beauties that are in your word. We are so blind at times, God. I can be so blind. And so we pray that you would be working in us right now, that you would convict us, God, and that you would lead us to be transformed for your glory. God, we pray that we would see a glimpse of you, of what Christ has done through this passage, and we pray that we would be uh, convicted to honour you with our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last verse of Joshua 19, the last verse of our passage says, so they finished dividing the land. Hopefully that's not a relief for some of you. We've been going through the dividing of the land for a few weeks now and we're seeing the final one. Hopefully it's not too much of a relief though for you. Um, I've really enjoyed going through these passages and there is so much here that we can see how all of God's word, it really is God breathed. And it really does equip us. And I hope we can continue to see that tonight as we go through this passage. The last few weeks we've been seeing the dividing of the land and here we get to another section in 18 uh, verse 1 to 2 really introduces it and shows it. It says, The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The country was brought under their control but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. As we look at chapter 18 and 19, uh, you might be thinking, oh, it's just another chapter, a couple of chapters on Israel receiving their inheritance. Surely there can't be much more here. But there's a lot more going on. There's something wrong here in this passage, and we see it at the beginning. There's a problem in Israel, and it's a problem that can plague us as well. Verse 3 in Joshua, it goes on to say, So Joshua said to the Israelites, How long will you wait before you take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? How long will you wait before you take possession of the land? Says Joshua. God's given them this land. Why won't they take it? 
Why do they need this push, this prod to go and take it? It seems like these seven tribes have gotten lazy and sluggish, and they've given up the task of taking their inheritance that God has given them. The word wait here in the NIV, it may have the idea of slackening off, relaxing, forsaking something, putting off something. And this is what these tribes have done with their inheritance. They've put it off. It's probably because they're weary. They've been at war for a while. It could be because of the travels they're weary from as well, and they want a break, and they're content just to dwell in the land that they already have and that they can dwell in with the other tribes, and they choose to relax. They quit the fight, they avoid the effort and the warfare, and they don't go and take the inheritance that God has given them. Are you like this as a Christian? Have you grown sluggish and weary? Are you quick to quit the fight? Do you settle content with the the comforts that you have now in this temporary fading life rather than living for the lasting inheritance that we have to come? Have you settled in the Christian life where you are content and you're at ease right now? You're content because you feel saved, you've maybe pray this prayer or you regularly go to church or you have a great Bible study that you go to or you live a fairly moral life or you serve God in a certain way and you feel content because of all those things. Are you content with how you are spiritually? Content that you know God, that those around you, those close to you know God as well and and that's enough and you don't care one bit about everyone else and spreading the good news to them. Too many of us at times are content as Christians, with where we are at. Too many of us are complacent and content with our lavished houses, our lavish lives, our tidy moral lives, our comfy seats at church, our cosy Bible studies where we feel comfortable, our service that makes us feel worthwhile to God and we just feel content and feel like we've got enough. But we should not be settled like this as Christians. We shouldn't become complacent. Why is this? Why shouldn't we be complacent like this? It's because the person who has faith in God should be hungry and desperate for more. They should be zealous for more, for more of Christ, for more evangelism, for more missions, for more discipling, for more growth, for more holiness in their life. They should be hungry for more, more. They want more. It's not enough what they have right now. They want more in Christ. The Christian should want more of God's kingdom to go out and they should not be content to just sit back and coast along in the Christian life. Secondly, why shouldn't we be complacent? We shouldn't be complacent or stagnant in the Christian life because Christ saved us to grow and to go forward. He saved us to grow. Titus 2 shows it says the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, godly, upright lives. God's salvation teaches us to say no to sin, to live godly lives. And so if you are stagnant, you're in a dangerous position. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 says as well, we must pay, pay close attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. We need to pay attention to what we've heard in Christ, to what we know, because if we don't, we could drift from it. It's, it's, the picture is that the Christian life is like a river, and if we stay still, we will drift. If we stay stagnant, we will drift, but we must pay attention. We must train ourselves to be godly, as Paul says as well. And a final reason, we need to not be content and settled spiritually. A final reason why we must not be like this is because The Christian life is one of war. The Christian life is one of war. Romans 8, 13 says, If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We're in a battle against sin. And we must wage war on the sin that Christ has already waged war upon. The only sin that we can battle is the sin that Christ has already paid for. But we must be vigilant and wage war on it and be fierce in our battle against sin. Isn't this what Jesus says in Mark 9 and in some of the other Gospels too? He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It's better to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. This is the degree to which we are to wage war on sin in the Christian life. So the Christian life must not be one of complacency. We must view life as war so that our senses are heightened and so that we are vigilant in this life. So what is going to stop complacency in us? What is going to stop us from seeking ease like the Israelites have here in verse 3 of chapter 18? Well, this passage is going to show us some things. But first, we must see the purpose here in this passage and really in this whole section of the distributing of the land. Joshua chapter 21, which we're going to get to in a couple of weeks, shows us the purpose really of this whole section. And it concludes with these words just after the Levites have received their towns. It says, Joshua 21, verse 43 to 45. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. We're going to see more on that in a couple of weeks, but here we're seeing Everything that's happening in the distribution of the land is showing how God is keeping his promises to give them an inheritance. That's the big point here. He's been faithful in keeping these promises. Now already, as we've seen in chapter 18, seven of these tribes have slackened off. They need now motivation to go and take their inheritance. And we see here in verse 1 that the camp has shifted from Gilgal now to Shiloh, right in the middle of Israel perfect for distributing the land. And they're in a perfect place as well. It says in verse 1, the country is under their control. They're at rest. There's peace. And yet seven tribes haven't gone and taken their inheritance. Joshua can't believe it, so he gets stuck into it and starts to give them the push that is needed and to allocate this land out so that they will go and then take it. And he says they're to go and assess the land, divide it into seven parts, and then cast lots and distribute the land to each of these tribes. So what purpose would have these things here had for the audience of Israel at Joshua's time? Well, what happens in our passage here is to remove in them all that was hindering them from going and taking their inheritance and to show them the faithfulness of God in how He keeps His promises. And we too need this stirring up into action We too need this so that we won't quit the fight and so that we won't avoid the warfare or relax in the Christian life because we are so prone to this. I feel this myself. We can be so prone to this. I can be so prone to this, to seeking ease and comfort rather than waging war and seeking more of God's kingdom. So what is going to pick us up from this, this bog of complacency that we can easily fall into? What's going to ready us for action? Well, there's five things here we see, and one of them, the first one is that we need to know that we are God's people. We need to know we are God's people. Right at the beginning in verse 1 of Joshua 18, it said, The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. As the people here gather before God, they are reminded that they are His people, and He's promised an inheritance to them. They're all going to get part of this inheritance And God deals fairly with them. And they're reminded here that God has a people. And we need to remember this too. God has a people. And we are His people through Christ. And it's a wonderful hope to know that God has a people. It is a freeing thing to know that when we realize it. But it's also a great responsibility. It's a great responsibility to know that we are God's people. And it should guard us from slackening off in the Christian life. Psalm 100 says, it is God who made us and we are His, we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. He's made us and that's why we're His. But then as well, 1 Corinthians 6 says at the end, you are not your own, you are bought at a price, therefore honour God with your body. God has made us and He has bought us through Christ and we are His people and therefore we are to glorify Him, we are to honour Him. So there's a great responsibility tied to being His people. And here we see 
the Israelites gather together, they would have been reminded that they are God's people receiving this inheritance. And we need to remember this and the great responsibility with this too so that we do not become complacent. Well, next, what will help us strip away this complacency that can often be in us? Well, the next thing we see, we need to know that we have a God that is providing. We have a God that is providing for us. In this section here, and we've been seeing it again and again in the inheritance, we're seeing how God is providing them an inheritance. It really makes it clear that God has given them this. Have a look at verse 3. You can see it right there in verse 3. It says, at the end, how long will you wait before you take the possession of the land that the Lord your God has given you? God has given this to them. He's provided for them. And we need to come back and bank on this hope that God provides. Here in Joshua, we are seeing the details of how God provides for His people. And God cares about the details here. We really see it through our passage. The, The details matter. He's concerned about keeping His promises in detail. And we see it here in these chapters. And what a blessing for us to know this. The bulk of our passage really shows this. If you have a look at it, cast your eyes with me onto Joshua 18 and 19. We see all these seven tribes receive their boundaries and their allotment, their allotted towns. We see it again and again. We see it for Benjamin at the beginning in verse 11 to 28 of chapter 18. And then we see it for Simeon in verse 1 to 9 of chapter 19. We see it for Zebulun. In 19, 10 to 16, we see it for Issachar. In 19, 17 to 23, we see it for Asher. In 19, 24 to 31, Naphtali. In 1932 to 39, and Dan in 19, 40 to 48. We see it again and again. And God is particular in showing how these promises have been fulfilled and they receive an inheritance. And then finally, at the end of the passage, we see it for Joshua, where he gets a town in the hill country of Ephraim. And just a side point here is, I think it's amazing to see the leadership of Joshua. He doesn't straight away run to claiming his inheritance. He's selfless here. He's, he waits to the end. He claims his inheritance at the end. Caleb got his at the beginning. Joshua could have gone then, but he waited to the end. We see the selfless quality here of a leader, and we see it in Joshua, which is so important. But back to, to the main point. Here we're seeing how God provides. God's providing an inheritance to Israel in detail, to show the certainty of His provision. And it should remind us here of the inheritance as well that we have in Christ to come. If you notice the second half of verse 1, it said, the country was brought under their control. That has the idea that the, the country was now at rest. The land had been subdued. God's given them this land, it subdued it. And this is a picture and a reminder for us of the rest that we have in Christ the future hope that we have through Him, because of His sacrifice, because of what He has done, because sin has been forgiven and conquered. And we are going to fully experience this rest one day in the new creation, where there is no death, there is no sin, no Satan, no insurances, no waiver forms, no medicines, no sleepless nights and sicknesses, no agony, none of these things. No losing our keys and these stressful moments that we go through. A place of perfect rest one day. We have this future rest to come and it is a great hope. It's a great hope. But having that hope should lead us to not be at ease here and to be complacent. No, it should cause us to long and pursue what we will one day inherit. That's what it should bring about. This future inheritance and all that God's provided for us, just like He provided an inheritance here, He's provided an inheritance for us through Christ and that inheritance should guard us from being content spiritually so that we instead long for what is to come and don't just sit back and cruise now. Now, I could think right now of a hundred ways that the future inheritance that the hope we have of what is to come could apply to our lives. We could all think of it for our own lives. There's so many, so many things that this applies to when we think of our future inheritance. It's so rich. But let me just give you one challenge. When we know we have this future inheritance coming, it should cause us to long for it and to live for it. And if that's the case, I want to ask them, why 
do we as Christians bank more of our hope and our time and our energy on investments and hobbies and things that are for now and that are going to vanish like a mist? Why do we bank all our hope on these things again and again and fail to invest in the eternal, unfading kingdom of God? You need to ask yourself, and I need to ask, are you treasuring, are we treasuring this life and all the hopes that we can find in it, everything that we can find in this life, are we treasuring that? Or is your hope set on the future that God will provide, the inheritance that you have in Christ through His death and resurrection? Too often we are so comfortable with what we have now, comfortable in our homes and we we just want to make our lives more and more comfortable. But the Christian life isn't one of comfort and ease now. We need to realize that souls are at stake. Other Christians need you. Non-Christians need you. You need other Christians as well. So we need to not be one of comfort and ease Instead, we need to be going out to people. We need to be amongst other Christians and not jeopardize jeopardize our souls by being away from from them. Don't pursue security or safety or ease or comfort in this life. This is counter Christian. Yes, we're we're safe eternally, and we need to remember that. That we are safe eternally through Christ. And in this life. Safety and comfort are not what Jesus has promised for us. That is to come. We must remember that, a fu- that future inheritance that is awaiting us and that God will not let us down, that He keeps His promises in detail as we've seen here in Joshua and that it will all be worth it in the end. And that knowledge of that future inheritance and what we have and how God will provide should free us from seeking ease right now but instead seeking to radically serve God, pursue His kingdom, and see others come into that as well. That future inheritance should stop us from being sluggish and complacent. Next, what else will stop us from complacency? Well, we need to know that we have God's presence. This is something we see very clearly in our passage. Having God's presence is key to enabling the Israelites to decide on the allotments and to take and claim their inheritance. 18 verse 1, right at the beginning, it says the tent of meeting is set up at Shiloh. This is the tabernacle here, and God's presence is shown to be among them right from the beginning. And it's given here a more permanent place than it has been before, where they've been moving around again and again. And the people are now gathered here at the tabernacle. And all they do is done now in the presence of God. And then again, in three times in chapter 18, it talks about them doing these things in the presence of God. And then at the end, as it sums up this whole section, at the end of verse 19, chapter 19, sorry, verse 51, it says, these are the territories that Eleazar, the priest, Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel assigned by Lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And so they finished dividing the land again and again. These things are happening in the presence of the Lord because big decisions must be made in His presence. They must be made in His presence. And for us now, through Christ, we are able to enter into God's presence through what He has done by His Spirit as we seek as well. God in His Word, we are able to come into His presence and one day we will fully be in God's presence in eternity. And Israel here, they too needed to know God's presence was among them. And they needed to do these things in God's presence. And being in God's presence is so key. And that's what we need to long for. The the hope of heaven isn't just heaven. It's the fact that we are going to one day be with God and in His presence. That's what we should be longing for. It, earlier in chapter 13, we, we saw the Levites, their inheritance was, it said uh, in chapter 13, verse 33, it says, their inheritance was the Lord, the God of Israel. 
13.33 says, The tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance, for the Lord, the God of Israel, is their inheritance. And in our passage, in 18 verse 7, it says, The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you, because the priestly service is their inheritance. For the Levites, their inheritance was serving God and was being in His presence. And that is the great hope of our inheritance too, to be with God. That's what Christ purchased for us. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for your sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to what? Why did Christ die? To bring you to God. That's what He's done. He's Christ has died to bring us back to God because we were his enemies. We were away from God. And Christ died to bring us back to God, into his presence, where there is fullness of joy. That's the hope we have to come. And that's what we need to be longing for in heaven. Well, what will stop us as we're going through? What will stop us from settling back in the Christian life, becoming complacent and slackening off? Well, the next thing we see that will stop us is realizing and knowing that we are under God's providence, under His control. Four times in chapter 18 and 19, chapters 18 and 19, it mentioned about doing things in the presence of God, but it also said something else four times and repeated it four times throughout. It talked about the casting of lots. Again and again, four times, the casting of lots. One example, chapter 18, verse 10, have a look. Chapter 18, verse 10 said, Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord, and there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. So the allotment of the land was done in the presence of God, under God's providence, by the casting of lots, showing that all of it was done according to God's will and what he desired. Now, we're not exactly sure what the lots were, what they looked like, but the key here is seeing that it was done under God's control. The the allotments were done under God's control, and, and we need to realize even the casting of dice or something that seems to us like so called chance is under God's control. Proverbs 16 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap. The lot is cast into the lap but it's every decision is from the Lord. This is the nature of God's control. And some, Now, sometimes we give up as Christians. We slacken off as Christians. We get weary. And it can be because we feel like we don't know what God wants. We don't know what He desires for us. But we see here, the Israelites made these decisions in the presence of God and they used the lots under God's control to make these decisions and know what God wanted. And I think there's some lessons here for us to know what God desires for us. Sometimes we wonder, what's God, God's will? How do I make these key decisions? And I think the first thing we've seen here in the passage is we need to do it in the presence of God. We need to seek Him. That's what they were doing. They did it all in the presence of God and we must do the same as we're making decisions. Jesus did it before he chose the 12 disciples in a night of prayer. We must do all in the presence of God as we seek to know what God wants for us. But also we must trust God as he leads. When we are in God's word, when we're reliant on him in prayer, when we're led by the spirit, when we're seeking to put to death sin, when we're growing in righteousness, when we're under godly counsel, the things that we desire often should be what God desires. If we're in His Word, if we're being led by Him, often they can be what God desires. And as we seek godly counsel, we seek Him in prayer, we seek His Word, what we desire should often be what God desires. But we have His Word to match it. We have His Word to check it by. We have his, we're able to go to His people and seek godly counsel in all of that. And it's another key way that can help us as we're making decisions and figuring out what is God's will for me? What does He want for me? But a a final thing I think we see here that's so key in knowing what does God want? What is His will? I think we need to focus on the clear commands that God's given us. We need to focus on those clear commands. Too often we neglect what God really clearly wants from us, thinking about things that He hasn't revealed. Focus on what He has revealed. 
and let God take care of those other things and put them into place. We know so much of what God's want, God wants for us. We know so much in His Word. We need to focus on that and do that. Well, here we're seeing we need to realize that we're under God's sovereign rule. He has control over all. And so we need to seek to do His will. He has control over all. We need to seek to do His will rather than just seeking ease or coasting in the Christian life. Seek to do what God desires. And then a final thing. How can we guard ourselves from complacency, guard ourselves from being settled and slackening off in the Christian life? We need to know that we can trust God's promises. We've said this again and again. God is faithful. He's been shown here to be faithful to His promises. He's done it for Israel. He's kept what He promised hundreds of years before. He's continuing to do it and to keep these promises. And when we know and believe the promises of God, like we saw, we have been seeing for a few weeks, when we know God's promises, they should cause us to act upon them. When we are certain of promises, the promises of God, they should cause us to act. God's promises should motivate us to action. They should motivate us to holiness, to spreading His kingdom, to wanting to tell others about Christ. Because when we know what we have done, have in Christ, that we have no condemnation. When we know some of the wonderful promises that we have in Christ, it should set us free to speak to others, to tell others, because it doesn't matter what they may think. It doesn't matter that they, we may be persecuted by them. It doesn't matter what we might have to give up to go and tell others of Christ. What matters is the promises that we have, what we have to come, and that should enable us to serve in those ways. Really, the, the Christian life really comes down to often holding on to God's promises and knowing Him. That's how we are saved. We get a promise of God, of how there can be forgiveness in Christ, how there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, and we cling to that. And then as a Christian, as we go on in life, we cling to God's promises still to be able to fight sin and to be able to serve Him. We need God's promises. I need God's promises to be able to to do anything in life. Even before this, I, I needed God's promises this afternoon. I needed to read passages where I was reminded that God is my refuge, that He is a help. I need these promises to be able to do anything in life. And we need to come back to God's promises and trust in them to be enabled to serve Him and not be complacent. Well, these things that we've seen here, these should grow our faith in God. They should grow us to not be complacent, but it's instead obedient to God and to serving Him in His kingdom. We need to know these things. We need to know that we are God's people. We need to know we have God providing for us, that we have God's presence and the future hope of being in God's, God's presence, that we are under God's care, His providence and His control and we need to know that we can trust God's promises. We have these things now and we will one day fully experience them and what a great hope we have and that, that these things here should motivate us and help us to battle complacency. Now as we close, I want us just to quickly look at two powerful examples in the Bible of people who looked ahead to their future hope and pressed on for it. The first one is, Someone from the tribe of Benjamin who took his inheritance serious, unlike the other tribes here that we saw. Someone from the tribe of Benjamin took his inheritance serious. He was one who considered everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. His inheritance, his true inheritance. He didn't sit content with everything in the here and now because he considered it as rubbish compared to the inheritance to come. And it was Paul. Paul goes on to say in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14, he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider I have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't sit back and relax. He didn't sit back content and just coast along in the Christian life. No, he pressed 
on. And he says later in that passage, in verse 15 and 17, all of us who are mature are to think in this way. And then verse 17, he says, join with others in following my example. We are to follow Paul in this. And we must remember too, though, how Paul did it. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, Paul says, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. That's what enabled Paul, and that's what enables us as well. And then the second powerful example of someone who did this in Scripture is the example of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it says that Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus looked ahead for what was to come, for the joy that was before him, and he endured in spreading God's kingdom in that way, no matter the cost. Without what he did, none of us could be saved. And he looked ahead for the, to the joy that was before him, and that enabled it. We need to look at him, We need to look at his example and we need to not grow weary and lose heart and become complacent. So may the promises of our future inheritance cause us to not coast along in the Christian life or to be spiritually content with where we're at now and not bother seeking anymore. May God's future inheritance and the promises we have to come not allow this. And instead, may they cause us to wage war and to seek more, to wage war on sin and to seek more of God's kingdom and so many other things that we have to come. May we do this for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you know what we need to hear, that you can bring conviction to our lives. I thank you that you are a God who is faithful, that you keep your promises and that we can bank on this certain hope that we have in you. God, we thank you for this and we pray that we would be a people who see the hope to come and live by that hope and live changed because of that hope. May we, God, always come back to all that we have in Christ and what he has done. And may this continue to change us in the here and now so that we would live for your glory. And we pray this in his name. Amen. I'm going to have another song now.